So uh, today we have a fairly specialized topic, and that is um, fig trees as keystone species in tropical forests. Uh, why to jump from um, very general uh, topics uh, as we had so far to something which in ecological textbooks has um, maybe one or two pages at maximum? Well, I am. I'm trying to show that um, when you pick up uh, any um, uh, topic uh, in ecology and go deep enough, then there are layers and layers of uh, additional complexities and interest. And so you basically can never end uh, digging, uh, digging to the bottom of it. So uh, with uh, FICUS, um, uh, partly also it's our favorite uh, system uh, for practical research. Um, uh, I'm doing with my colleagues. And um, so FICUS is a good example of uh, this approach. Um, apart from that, um, fig trees have always uh, fascinated people in the tropics. Um, and um, it's um, clear from the fact that uh, they are very important in, in several religions. Um, they have their place uh, in the Bible and uh, also Buddha uh, sat under uh, Ficus religiosa tree and reached uh, enlightenment there, which um, is pretty important. And um, that's why Ficus religi religiosa is a uh, very popular uh, tree uh, to plant around, uh, around stupas in uh, Buddhist countries. This is an example from Sri Lanka. And um, this is again um, a ficus religiosa from Sri Lanka, which uh, this particular tree uh, was planted uh, um, 2,300 years ago. And so it is believed to be the oldest uh, planted tree in the world. And it's a sort of a pilgrimage uh, site uh, in Sri Lanka. You can buy a little golden uh, ficus religiosa uh, there uh, on the street as well. And then um, Lord Krishna also uh, did not forget about ficus. And so we have, uh, we have quite a pantheon here. Uh, but uh, focusing on biology, um, ficus is a huge genus of trees, 870 species. Uh, of course, what is one genus and what is not um, is partly taxonomic decision, and um, ficus has an excellent uh, defining uh, trait, excellent synapomorphy, and that is the the thick um, fruitescence itself. Uh, we will we will uh, look at it later. Uh, it's it's a very distinct uh, distinct feature, and that's uh, that prompted the botanists to keep uh, such a huge genus together, although. Without that, uh, we can be pretty sure there will be a lot of uh, different genera because otherwise um, there is such a diversity of ecologies and morphologies and other features that, uh, that uh, without that um, uh, synapomorphy of thick, uh, nothing would keep the, the genus together. Uh, it's primarily tropical, uh, tropical, speech, uh, tropical genus and the uh, global uh, center of diversity is uh, on the island of New Guinea, where, where there are 157 species so far. Um, this is just example of some morphological diversity. We know the edible figs, uh, but then there are also uh, others which look a li little bit like cherries. Uh, they, are, they are small and, and numerous on the trees. Uh, there are also different uh, lifestyles. Um, one very specialized are strangler figs, um, where uh, the Fig plant, fig tree starts uh, as an epiphyte uh, from a seed, which is uh, which is usually dispersed by dispersed by birds, and then sends uh, roots uh, down to the ground. Then, once they are rooted, then it forms uh, a mesh of uh, roots and stems around around the whole tree, and finally, as it as it thickens and grows, will strangle the whole tree and that tree will decay and so finally you have um, you have a tunnel where originally was the trunk of the tree. 
Another distinct uh, form are so-called banyan fig trees, uh, which is from Hindu um, for market, where, where they, they like to actually set up markets under the, the huge banyan trees. Uh, they have sort of horizontal uh, branches, which have secondary, um, which have secondary uh, roots. Uh, and so one tree can create a really large sort of forest of secondary stems and roots. Uh, example is ficus bengalensis. These are just uh, other um, examples of diversity of uh, figs from New Guinea. And this is just uh, uh, randomly uh, selected uh, leaves of um, 15 different uh, fig species in one forest in New Guinea, just to show also morphological diversity. People typically know the, the, uh, the uh, potted plant, uh, Ficus elastica, that's one type of the leaves, uh, uh, rich in latex, uh, tough, glossy, but uh, that's only one form. There are also figs with uh, hairy leaves, uh, very soft leaves, uh, with, with almost no latex and so on and so on. Now, what is so special about uh, figs? Well, everything, uh, because after all, they, they are in every textbook. Well, uh, everything um, derives from a very specialized pollinating system, which um, uh, is based on the principle that the pollinator will, uh, which, is, which is a fig wasp, will also lay eggs into the flowers. And uh, so the fate of the progeny depends on the success of pollination. And so with this system, um, that, that um, facilitates development of very specialized pollinators. Because if you, if you land on a wrong species and don't pollinate it, then the, the fitness penalty is absolute. All your progeny is going to die. So that's pretty efficient system. And from, from that system uh, derives a lot of uh, other features, uh, large diversity, extreme pollinator specificity. Um, there are also, uh, as in any mutualism, there are conflicts of interest between, between fig wasps and, um, and, um, uh, and the figs, because um, the fig wasps are, are pollinators and herbivores uh, at the same time. Uh, and then there are, of course, uh, as on any mutualism, there are parasites, uh, uh, you know, riding on that relationships. Um, and then uh, due to some specifics of the fig wasps, uh, there is aseasonal flowering and fruiting, which actually leads to um, uh, ficus being keystone resources for frugivorous um, herbivores, because, because they can be present uh, even in seasons where other fruits are not. And uh, also the specialized system leads to very high dispersal efficiency and therefore often very low uh, population density of some of the figs still st surviving in the forest. So all these um, suite of uh, traits and ecological features uh, derives from this uh, uh, fairly specific pollination system, which we will be um, looking into it. This is how um, fig uh, looks like uh, when you cut it open, it's, uh, it's an inflorescence. So the flowers are inside in the cavity. So these are flowers and this is osteol. This is the only entry uh, inside, inside the cavity. Um, so this is, this is a New Guinea, uh, New Guinea species Spicus brucei, named after our uh, collaborator and botanist uh, Bruce Isua, He's, you see him here. And then, um, as many times in this lecture, we will start with some kind of explanation and then we will introduce complicating features. So let's start with the simplest explanation of the fixed structure. And that is that it has uh, both male and female flowers inside. And so here you can see um, these, are, um, these are female flowers um, and uh, with, with uh, stigma and then um, there are male flowers which are which are producing producing uh, pollen. Okay, the whole cycle um, we can start at any part of the cycle, obviously. But let's start when uh, let's start when the fig wasps are uh, 
adult fig wasps are emerging inside of the of the fig. Um, typically, fig wasps uh, females uh, are winged, and males are wingless. Um, so that means that uh, they all mate inside of the fig, and then um, the male chew out the tunnel for for the females, and then the females fly out, uh, search for um, another receptive um, uh, fig, and then they they get inside through the osteol, and then there um, they will um, press against the flowers, and so uh, they will pollinate the flowers because they are carrying uh, they are carrying pollen on the thorax, uh, which they collected before before leaving the uh, their uh, fig where they were born, and then at the same time using ovipositor because it's a hymenoptera. Um, uh, the ovipositor goes through the through the uh, stylus to ovule and uh, oviposit um, eggs, which then um, hatch into larvae. Larvae are feeding on the on the ovule, consume it, and then pupate. And then the next generation of fig wasps is born. They they emerge, uh, collect pollen, mate, and and the whole cycles go again. That's the pollinating wasps. But then um, the, the whole relationship is also hijacked by um, other herbivores, uh, which we call the galling non-pollinating fig wasps, which are taxonomically from different group, and they are ovipositing through the um, wall of the fig, so they, they, they are not able to get inside, and uh, again, um, their larvae are herbivores, and they are feeding again on the ovules there, and then we have um, parasitoids, which are also pollinate, uh, also ovipositing through the through the fig, but into the larvae of either pollinating or galling um, uh, herbivores. And so there is a little little uh, food web uh, inside of the fig, um, because they are pollinating through outside of the wall. Then um, the later in in the development of fig, uh, when when the wall is thicker, the longer the ovipositor has to be. So some of these uh, wasps have, have bizarrely long ovipositors. And again, in this in these non-pollinating wasps, males are again wingless, and and they also mate inside of the fig, and then they again leave uh, through the through the tunnel. So the Agaonids pollinating wasps are very tiny, and the, the, you, you can see several species. Um, this example uh, has very, very conspicuous conical head that helps to get through the osteol, because osteol is basically a way to prevent uninvited guests entering the fig. And so the pollinating wasps uh, has to go through these um, uh, through this um, osteol, and during that time, it loses wings. So basically, it's a one way. It's one way inside of the fig. There is no way if um, it makes mistake and comes to a wrong a wrong species of fig. There is no way uh, how to get how to get uh, out again. And then um, this is this is a schematic of uh, how it oviposits through through stylus into into the ovary. Um, this is an important issue here because, as we will see, then some of the uh, some of the ovaries are protected from this oviposition by having a very long stylus, so that the ovipositor will not reach all the way all the way for oviposition. And so these are the this is the photograph of the of the flowers, and this is the fig wasps uh, emerging emerging from from the ovary. Now the pollinating. Uh, pollinating can be uh, active or passive. Um, the ancestral state is passive pollinating, and uh, then uh, there was uh, there was an active one which um, is character characterized by by pockets on the thorax for pollen and brushes on uh, on the legs, which uh, when when the 
the thing was actively sweep pollen uh, to the pockets. And so, so they, they carry it. And then uh, when you look at the phylogeny on the generic level of uh, pollinating wasps, then um, um, the active pollinating um, developed and then was lost at, at some lineages again. And, and there is one genus which is, which is uh, mixed for, for active and passive pollinating. Now, what is interesting is that um, the, there is always tension in mutualism. And so um, uh, the figs have to be careful so that uh, the pollinating wasps will not stop pollinating um, some of them, uh, you know, cheating. Uh, you can actually cheat a little bit if you enter the same fig as honest fig wasp and that honest fig wasp will pollinate for you. Um, so, so there is a certain degree of cheating possible, but um, the fig tree which uh, have their uh, pollinating wasps with passive pollinators, well, there is, you know, it's passive. So there is not much, not much uh, activity of the fig wasp where, where it can cheat. But with active pollinators, that takes time and that takes energy to, to get the pollen and so uh, interestingly, it's these species of figs which host um, active pollinators, which develop penalties for low level of pollination. If the, if the developing fix is not properly pollinated, then uh, it will often abort. And so uh, this is a phylogeny of figs uh, with um, passive pollination have no sanction and then active pollination have sanctions either uh, the the reduction in the number of developing flowers or abortion of the entire entire fig. And that, gave, that goes against the fig wasps, which are either passively or actively pollinating. And then um, there are actually rarely some species which where the mutualism, uh, mutualism um, uh, de degenerated into parasitism where, where these are uh, cheating non-pollination wasps and that's the only that's that's one of the few cases where the same ficus has a more than one fig wasp one is honestly pollinating and then the sister species is not so these are just uh, showing um, the uh, the penalties this is the relative fitness of non-pollinating wasps which can be hugely reduced almost to zero in some cases for active pollinators but but not not for the not for the passive ones now this relationship between the figs and fig wasps uh, is at least 65 million years old based on the fossils and uh, 34 million years uh, uh, before there is already uh, there is already um, uh, active pollinating with, with pollen pockets uh, in fossil records. And when we look at the fossils, then um, looks like for at least 10 or maybe several tens of millions of years, there has been no, no major innovation. You know, basically we, we see the, the whole, the, the, the same old system there. Now, this is the broad scale um, uh, pollinator um, host evolution uh, where highly unlikely for pollinators, there is generally a correspondence of one species of fig has one species of pollinating fig wasp. And yes, there are some exceptions, geographical variability. Um, uh, uh, there can be some rare examples of more than one fig wasp, but, but by and large in these hundreds and hundreds of figs, you have one-to-one -one correspondence. And not only that, but also higher level uh, correspondence of um, phylogeny. Uh, so when you look at the ways uh, how the figs can acquire the, the pollinating fig wasps, it can be either co-speciation. So that means that both uh, fig wasps and figs speciate at the same time or host switching so that um, the, the fig wasps can jump and, and can jump either across the evolution or can still go to the nearest uh, relative but later in in later in the time so so the the, the fig uh, speciation is separated in time from from the fig wasp speciation analyzing the phylogenies of figs and their fig wasps uh, looks like cross speciation is is the norm there um, this is the estimated age of um, the speciation events for 
spikers and their fig wasps. And you can see that they are pretty much uh, happening at the same time. So we have this kind of model basically for figs and fig wasps rather than host switching, which leads to incongruent phylogenies. Um, this is a this is a nice uh, example of um, uh, speciation um, speciation in action. Uh, this is an elevational gradient at Mount Wilhelm in Guinea, uh, where, where Simon Seeger, at, um, formerly at our laboratory, uh, with uh, with his team was looking at molecular structure of some figs and their fig wasps, and they actually found that they are separated into a, a lowland and highland, you can say subspecies or, or genetically distinct populations, which um, we can imagine might, uh, might uh, in the future uh, produce, uh, produce different species. Again, as you can see, for instance, here, Ficus trichocerasa, uh, really corresponding with, with, with the wasps. So this is an uh, again example of co-speciation uh, from New Guinea selection of New Guinea ficus and their their ficus wasps with, from from our colleague George Weiblen, and this is uh, his analysis of non-pollinating wasps where uh, that co-speciation no longer is majority model and there is there is a lot of uh, host switching and also there are more species of non-pollinating wasps uh, per per host. Um, there can be uh, a little little uh, food web. So this is example from Ficus hispidoides. This is the, its picture. This is the pollinating wasp, uh, Ceratosolen. And then there are two other species at least, which are bowlers. That means herbivores. This is the balls they are producing. And then there are uh, free parasitoids, which are uh, attacking either the bowlers or the pollinator. Uh, another example, um, um, there is, um, there is, um, uh, again, yeah, you, you can also see the, the dimorphism in the, uh, in the parasitoid wasps, again, extremely long ovipositor and then, um, uh, flightless male. Uh, another example, um, this is, um, uh, ficus bird Davy. Uh, this is the pollinator and then, uh, there are again, uh, there are again the uh, the gaulers and then uh, the long ovipositor. Uh, that's the uh, that's the parasitoids. Some more interesting morphology. Um, this is example of a sort of a fig wasp community. These are three uh, fig species uh, from Africa and. This is the phylogeny of their uh, pollinators, parasitoids, and gaulers. Uh, pollinators are nicely pollinators are nicely separated, uh, and then uh, you can see that on the other hand, um, although there is some phylogenetic signal, then switching between between being gaulers and parasitoids is surprisingly uh, common in the in the phylogeny. Um, this is example of. Um, how the fig is ripening and increasing in size. And so for all those wasps ex except pollinator, which is number three, they have to oviposit from outside. And so there are different uh, phylogenetic, there are different ontogenetic stages for the fig. And uh, there is a sequence of oviposition, oviposition of these wasps, basically from one to seven, as you can also see with increasing length of the of the ovipositor. This is specifically for Ficus racemosa. Um, the non-pollinating wasps uh, are calcites, and um, there is an example of the phylogeny. And um, uh, this is the characteristics. Uh, this is pretty much the, the same picture as the previous slide. Again, increasing uh, size of the fig and different strategies. Uh, Gaulers go first, uh, typically, and then uh, pollinators, and then um, and then uh, parasitoids, because of course the pollinators and gaulers have to already be for the parasitoids, and then there might be late stage gaulers again. And uh, this is the phylogeny, where uh, again you can see parasitoids and 
roller switching. As I said, that there is always uh, an exception in FICAS to, to everything. Then there are there is actually one lineage of rollers which are able to enter via osteol um, exactly as uh, pollinating phycosis. Also, uh, another uh, exception to the general pattern is, uh, is the uh, wing condition of males. Uh, a vast majority of uh, species have only wingless males. That's the, uh, that's the blue part of the phylogeny here. But then uh, there are species which have winged males. And then there are also some which are dimorphic. And that has some interesting, interesting consequences. Because um, the wingless males, both for pollinators and for non-pollinating, means that um, the fig wasps all mate inside of their, their native fig. And in some cases, uh, only one female enters the fig and is responsible for all the eggs there. So all the mating is between brothers and sisters. And so that's really, um, uh, that's really um, mating which promotes uh, unequal, uh, unequal sex ratios. We know the theory behind one-to-one -one sex ratios, which is for panmictic population, but the more related uh, the, the partners, the more related the, the set of mating individuals is, then the more it's favored to have a biased sex ratio in favor of females. And so this is an example of, this is a nice model uh, to, to um, empirically examine this theory because um, for the dimorphic, um, for the dimorphic um, um, males, then they can mate, uh, the wingless ones can, will mate inside of the uh, fig, and then the winged ones can um, have much broader range of partners, unrelated ones, and then the winged are more close to panmictic population than, than others. And indeed, the, when you look at the proportion of males, then it gets close to 50% for winged males, nothing special, but for the uh, uniformly wingless, um, there, is a, there is a highly biased uh, female to male ratio. That is, uh, that's the, that's the, how, how males are mobile, but another factor is also the number of foundress females which are entering the thick. And, of course, it's partly random, but not entirely, because the, the large-sized figs tend to have more females entering than the small-sized figs. And so again, this is the proportion. Uh, this is a proportion of males um, uh, based on the number of uh, foundresses. That means the, the the females which will oviposit in in a single fig. So. Again, the highest bias is uh, in the fix where typically only one female enters. And so all the mating is between brothers and sisters. Another system which um, our, our biological theory, which we can test on uh, the fig, fig, um, fig wasp um, uh, model is the vir virulence of parasites. Again, um, it's clear that the, the interest of parasites uh, is to maximize the rate of transmission uh, of their progeny. And of course, if you have single female entering the fig and uh, producing the entire new generation, which will mate among it, uh, themselves, then uh, if that fig wasp is uh, uh, parasitized, for instance, by nematodes, then for these nematodes, they only can be transferred to the progeny of that, uh, of that infected um, female. And so uh, there is a strong selection not to be virulent, not to harm the reproductive ability of that female, because then it will harm their chances of, of, of transmission. But if the infected female enters peak where there will be a number of other females, then of course it uh, makes sense for nematodes to maximize the, uh, their a reproduction inside of the host fig wasps, and because there is always chance that even if it uh, even if it compromises its health, then they can jump to the progeny of other um, fig wasps in that fig. And indeed, 
when you look at the proportion of single foundresses entering FIC against how virulent are their nematodes, then the situation where typically only one female enters the FIC, then the nematodes will not harm the reproductive potential of their host at all. It's still at 100%, while when there are more FIC wasps likely to be around, then, then the, the infected FIC wasps can have 85% uh, of, of standard fertility. Okay, so that's uh, that sort of introduction to the system, and now we can go to complications. So one interesting complications, uh, complication is so-called uh, gynodioecious species of FIGs. So just to repeat, um, the monoecious species have uh, both a male and female uh, flowers inside, and so that means every fig is producing uh, seed as well as pollen. Basically, uh, those ovaries which, which are spared from, from oviposition by fig wasps will develop into seeds. Those which are eaten by larvae, then they will produce the adult fig wasps. They will collect pollen produced male by male flowers and they fly out. So, so this is a mixed production. Genodiaceous species are separated into, into entirely seed production and uh, entirely pollen production. And um, this, is, uh, this is achieved by the fact that um, the pig with um, male flowers have uh, also short stylus on the female flowers. So they all are available for oviposition. And so the fig wasps can consume all the female flowers and then collect pollen and fly out. So that fig only produces, uh, it's, it's functionally, functionally male, although it has both female and male flowers. That's why it's called uh, not dioecious, but genodioecious. And then the other fig has all the styluses uh, long. And so when the fig wasps enter, uh, enters, then it will try to oviposit uh, in the process, will pollinate all of them, but uh, will not reach uh, to the ovary and so will die without, without any success. And so there will be no fig wasps. And so the whole fig will only produce uh, produced seeds. Okay, this, this system, well, specialization is always oh, can be or can be beneficial. So you can say, well, this is actually a, you know a advantage system, but it's very dangerous because you know apparently it, we would guess it could be unstable because um, this uh, seed fig is really le lethal for the fig wasp. If uh, if a fig wasp enters it, then there is a 100% fitness penalty. It will it will die without progeny. So there is a huge selection for fig wasps to tell which uh, pig is seed one and which is pollen producing one, and only enter the pollen ones. And you know for some reason the figs are winning this race. And and um, from the existence of lots of uh, genodiaceous species, we can conclude that this. Maybe happen sometimes, but not always. And so, uh, so in this case, the uh, the interest of pig actually wins over the interest of pig wasp. And um, uh, despite the, the strong advantages of being able to recognize the two figs that, that they can't, but you know it may, it introduces potentially unstable element because if the fig wasp learn to recognize that, then um, that means. Um, the population will still function of the of the figs, but uh, but the the seed production will cease. So, you know, there will be only uh, only fig wasps will be for some some time being produced and circulated, but but the fig will have no seeds. Okay, so this is the summary of the cycles which I just described, and um, these are. Uh, the, the stylus length uh, for the mono, uh, monoecious figs, there is a variety of stylus length. So some of them are available for oviposition. This is the length of the ovipositor. So some of them are available, some of them are not. Um, while here, this is the, um, uh, again, this is the length of the stylus and ovipositor and um, uh, which, uh, which is, um, 
uh, sort of bimodal and uh, this higher higher end is completely unavailable in the seed fix for, for the for the wasp. Um, what is also sort of mysterious is why uh, the pollinating fig wasps uh, do not uh, evolve, do not develop longer ovipositor. Obviously, when you look at the parasitoids, it's, it's quite possible uh, with their huge ovipositors. So it's, it's really not sure, despite this strong uh, selection pressure, they, they don't do it. OK, why, why this complication? Why uh, genodiasi? OK, we will see that one, one uh, advantage is that if you separate the seed and pollen production, then um, you need to attract uh, frugivores to spread your seeds. And so you have to pump sugars into, into fruit so, so that frugivores will, will be coming. And if you only, if you have the same number of seeds, but uh, concentrate it all to the, uh, to the half of the figs, then you can save on these, uh, on these sugars. Um, at the same time, another possibility is that um, the diversious figs also seem to reduce the diversity and numbers of non-pollinating wasps, which of course are enemies of the figs. And so, because they also die in the seed fox, seed, seed figs. So the number of non-pollinating wasp species uh, per, per fig species is uh, remarkably different for diaceous figs. It's uh, somewhere around three species. Monoecious figs get four times as much. Okay, the most famous uh, genodiaceous fig is Ficus carica. That's the, that's the edible one. And so that also means that uh, we are eating, of course, the seed figs. And so that means that there is only one or very few uh, dead um, fig wasps inside of each fig, which entered, uh, tried oviposit, pollinated everything, and then died. Um, Genodiaceous figs evolved only in the paleotropics. So, so the neotropical figs simply don't have this uh, innovation. Um, uh, these are the number of uh, number of fig species where, as you can see, there are very few uh, genodiaceous in Africa, and but at the same time, there is a majority in Southeast Asia in the green region. The majority are actually genodiaceous. And again, uh, it's not really clear. I think it, it warrants new analysis, but um, looks like uh, even such a complicated system like genodiaceous uh, developed repeatedly on on the on the ficus on the ficus phylogeny where um, you can see uh, you can see the uh, you can see the the uh, change the, the switches between 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 blue and yellow here okay um, now when we are asking about when we are asking about um, diversity of ficus then um, we can we can look at um, uh, we can look at whether you know it's uh, stimulated by by pollination mode by mono DOSC um, and also by life form and so again this is the phylogeny of fix with uh, speciation rate um, shown by by the shade of uh, from from low in blue to to high in yellow and then you don't see the details but but that's okay there are um, different different ecological traits, active and passive pollination, dioecious, monoecious, and then also the life form because figs can be shrubs, climbers, large trees, or hemiepiphytes. And um, it looks like, um, disappointingly, um, there is no strong pattern which would explain the speciation rate of figs by, by their ecology. Um, and But then there is an interesting uh, probability uh, probabilities of transition between life forms, which, which are shown here. So uh, there is quite a big traffic both ways between large tree and shrub and shrub or small tree. So, so that can evolutionarily be rather flexible. Then there is a one way, uh, one way route from shrub or small tree to climber, 
with, with the opposite direction almost non-existent. And then, however, from climber, you can also graduate to hemiepiphyte, uh, while any other connection of hemiepiphytes are very rare, either getting out of hemiepiphytic lifestyle or getting into it from somewhere else than climber. Now, I mentioned uh, the fact that uh, these um, dioecious pigs, uh, they have two types of uh, fruits and only one of them um, should be in the interest of pig to, to be eaten by frugivores. And so they have a very different uh, uh, content of sugars. And so uh, the pig does not really want pig wasps to tell the difference between, between uh, seed fig and and um, and uh, pollen fig but it actually wants the frugivores to to be able to tell the difference and they do when you see a fig tree in the forest with pile of uneaten uh, fruits below that you can be pretty sure this is the uh, this is the pollen production this is the a male uh, male fig tree where where the uh, the fruits release their fig wasps and uh, now they are not very attractive to any uh, anybody because they have a low sugar content. So um, when speaking about the different uh, when speaking about the different um, uh, interests in this mutualism, then um, what fig trees want? They want of course their flowers to be pollinated. Uh, they want wasps uh, entering uh, entering also female figs, not being uh, able to tell difference. They also want to have a uh, wasp sex ratio with many more females than males, um, because um, of course only females are, are spreading their pollen. And they want to have long distance pollen dispersal. So, um, the flowers pollinated and long distance pollen dispersal, um, these are joint interests, there is no conflict. Uh, wasps entering female fix is of course bad for the wasps, but looks like fix tend to win. And sex ratio, whatever fix, whatever is uh, optimum for fix, uh, this, is really con uh, this is really controlled by, um, uh, by the fig wasps. Now, as I mentioned already, we have basically two types of morphological uh, morphological types of figs: small red ones and large green ones. The small red ones, cherry-like, are typically dispersed by birds, which are orienting themselves visually. And because they are small, they typically have few foundresses entering them, which means that they have highly biased. Uh, female uh, bias sex ratio, and then uh, avirulent nematodes, while large green figs are um, olfactory attract olfactorily attracting bats, um, have typically many uh, foundresses, uh, less biased sex ratio, and, and virulent nematodes as a consequence. However, these dispersal syndromes, um, they are based on morphology. The, there, there, there is some flexibility, but typically this is the ordination of uh, fruit um, uh, characteristics with um, different dispersals, bad birds, uh, birds or, or mixed. And so the bird syndrome, uh, smaller, softer, darker, um, and uh, this, this large one uh, are for an aromatic for bad syndrome. But again, when you look at the thick phylogeny, these syndromes are quite flexible and can be um, uh, can be fluctuating phylogenetically. Now, um, figs um, are very important for frugivores, and uh, there are of course some species which are more specialized on them than others. This is an example of the diet of uh, five uh, hornbills in Borneo, and um, this is the percentage of uh, diet based on figs. So. Clearly, clearly, there is a, there is a, there is a large um, dependency of the hornbills. Um, this is the uh, number of uh, vertebrate frugivores recorded for a given number of phyca species. So most of them have records of one to five frugivores. Of course, that can be incomplete, but there are species which have uh, more than twenty and even more than fifty of frugivores. 
this is the overlap between birds, bats, and arboreal mammals. So again, these syndromes are sort of probabilistic. There is a lot of overlap, as you can see, and there are actually um, there are actually um, in this diagram 50, 54 species even which are consumed by all all three groups. So why why fix are keystone species? Uh, because um, fig wasps are pollinators and um, they lead to asynchronous flowering, um, which leads to constant production of figs. And so they become key food resource in, in the low season for other fruits. Um, why there is a asynchronous flowering? Well, because fig wasps are short living. And so once they leave the fig with their pollen, they have to find uh, very quickly uh, another fig, which is in the recept receptive stage. So the, the fig has the fig has a phase where um, the uh, female flowers are ready to be pollinated. And that's, that's when the fig wasp has to enter. Then there is a phase of the fig wasps developing. And then when they hatch, then there is a phase where the male, male flowers open and produce pollen so that fig wasps can collect it. And so every time, um, the fig is in that stage and is, is um, producing the fig wasps, then in the local population of that fig species, there has to be at least some trees which are in this receptive stage so that they can accept um, fig wasps. Otherwise, if there are none, then the whole local population of uh, fig wasps will, will go extinct. And that actually happens and you know, figs have time um, uh, they can survive some years without without pollinators, but then um, sooner or later they will have to reacquire the, the be recolonized by the fig wasps. So to avoid that, they tend to tend to flower um, asynchronously. So there is always some receptive figs in the population. So the fig wasps can jump can jump between trees and avoid the local extinction, which is shown here, where, where, where in, this, uh, in this situation, there is a, uh, they emerged from the tree and there is no receptive uh, phase. This is the practical exam example. These are individual trees, 52 individual trees of Ficus bordavi, and when they are flowering um, from uh, during one year. So when you draw the vertical line anywhere here, you will always find some flowering individuals. And so this is the production of uh, figs for frugivores as opposed to some other uh, ones which, which uh, are favored by orangutans in Sumatra. And so that explains why for many frugivores figs are really keystone resource. Now we mentioned also long distance pollinating. These, um, Speci specialized pollinators are very conductive to that. Um, there is a, an, a study which uh, used a favorable pattern of uh, Ficus sycomorus growing in Africa along, uh, along a river with, with no other Ficus uh, conspecific vegetation anywhere uh, around. And so by, by sequencing DNA, it was possible to see um, which um, fig wasps from which tree pollinated the others. And so they were looking at this mother tree here and then looking how far the pollinating went. And the mean pollinating distance was 89 kilometers, maximum 165. So, so that's, that's quite, quite substantial. And um, so um, from some studies, um, um, there were uh, some simple calculations uh, with known density of uh, adult trees per hectare, and then uh, they could see what was the, at a given time, what was the number of wasp producing trees, which was only a fraction, and then um, what was the number of different parent trees uh, 
where the FICOS came from, which again could be could be seen genetically on the assumption that only uh, brothers and, and sisters made for each tree, and then uh, for each fig, and then uh, you can have a quite substantial source area in hectares from where uh, fig wasps coming to a particular tree are coming from. So, so there is a big um, uh, long distance, uh, you know, pollinating efficiency. Uh, figs, because they are so favor uh, favorite food of rugivores, are also very good colonizers. Um, this is coming back to uh, Krakatau and uh, the primary succession there and colonization of the islands. Um, here is the timeline for colonization by figs. And so um, the upper curve is cumulative. So um, as of um, 110 years after, after the explosion, uh, there were at least temporarily uh, 24 different fig species and uh, 20 species actually, uh, actually present. Of course, they can colonize first and then they have to wait for fig wasps to, to arrive as well. Now, finally, we can also ask um, we can also ask a question: How the fig wasps mutualism evolved, and um, because it's so so unique. And so this is the phylogeny of the family Moraceae with with um, um, ficus in green, and then different lineages in different colors. Unfortunately, uh, Moraceae has a variety of pollinating systems, and so. Without phylogeny, we can only guess uh, which system was was um, uh, um, used to develop these ficus fig wasps. Uh, they have wind pollination. Uh, they have also trips, uh, Tisanoptera, and they have also uh, Diptera golmiges as pollinators. Uh, this is, for instance, Altocarpus. Um, the phylogeny shows that it was actually trips. You can see with Castile. They are semi enclosed, so you can see the steps morphologically towards the enclosed fig. And of course, the Sanoptera are um, completely unrelated to, to wasps, but they are also morphologically, they are this type of small, uh, small insect. So we can see some kind of uh, pre adaptation to this. Okay, so. We already stressed that uh, the, the, the secret of this um, uh, system is that it's a combination of pollinating and feeding on the, on the seeds. Um, uh, and so we can ask where else we can see the systems like ficus and agonide pollinating wasps with um, actually only few few systems like that and none of them so diverse as the fig, fig wasps. Uh, one is yucca and uh, Tegeticula moths, which is Eponomeutidae family. Uh, another is Trollius, in Czech Upolin, and uh, Antomide flies. And another one um, is Glochidium, and also other, other uh, genera of um, tropical Euphorbiaceae, and again, small moths, this time from, from Gracilaridae. So when we look at the, this is the example of yucca plants, so again, the moths are ovipositing and the larvae are developing in, uh, in, in the ovules. Um, this is example of the, uh, of the phylogeny where there is the lineage of uh, pollinating, uh, pollinating moths and they have a repeated development of, uh, of cheaters. So, so they don't pollinate, they only oviposit and um, we have seen very rarely this happening in uh, fig wasps, but it looks like uh, this mutualism in yucca is, is less, less stable. Epicephala and Glochidium, uh, same system. Uh, it was actually described uh, only in uh, 2003 by, by Kato and, and other Japanese researchers uh, found in Southeast Asia. And um, then they got inspired and um, looked at other um, uh, other systems and find some more. So this is this is the Glochidium and Epicephala. So again, we see mostly co-speciation, although there are some jumps across the phylogeny. And then um, there is also Brainia, another U4BAC where where the system is the same. And again, it's a um, it's a um, 
gracilarity and then Philanthus, another another U4BC system. Um, this was all published in um, 2004, um, these two systems. Um, unfortunately, we were actually studying, we were studying FIX and uh, had our colleague George Weiblen as a, as a FIC was specialist in the team. Um, we studied herbivores in New Guinea feeding on Brainia and also feeding on Philanthus. And before this was discovered. And unfortunately, despite this kind of background, we completely missed, you know, we were looking at the leaf chewing caterpillars and um, colleague George Weiblen was looking at uh, fig pollinators, uh, but only in figs. We were looking at herbivores, but in Brainia and, uh, and um, Philanthus, but not paying attention what's happening with flowers. And because of this kind of specialized blindness, we, we have missed uh, you know, discovery of interesting system, which, which then the Japanese colleagues came, uh, came with. And uh, that's, the, that's the end for for the FICUS lecture. Thank you for, for the attention.